Thank you guys for being out here tonight. Stand with me, 295, revive us again. that brought all that good food. Now I'm too full, so we'll all go to sleep during the message, brother. I don't know what to do about it. There, you're going to go to sleep. <laughs> all right. Well, yeah, it was good, and I, I appreciate uh, those of you who helped and uh, participated with that. Uh, let's uh, begin tonight, though, by looking to the Lord in prayer and asking his blessing upon the service, if we can, please. Uh, and we're going to ask uh, Brother Hurd to uh, lead us, please. blessed I think every night so far of our missions conference with the messages uh, meeting missionaries uh, brother Stamper's presentation last night was a true blessing uh, uh, 
what's taken place uh, over the years as we've supported that, that ministry and so thankful that we've been able to have a part of that. Just a couple of things with, uh, very quickly, just to remind you, gentlemen, we have a prayer breakfast in the morning. If you haven't signed up, I guess it's still time tonight. But, uh, oh, they girls have had such good food for us at these prayer breakfasts. And they've switched it up a little bit, I think. So I'm not going to tell you, but I can tell you you can get fat. So, so we'll enjoy it. Nine o'clock in the morning, so come be part of that, and we appreciate that. And then I'll continue to pray over the uh, missions brochure as uh, we use the theme, uh, striving together for the faith of the gospel and for the conference, striving uh, together to reach the world. You know, the idea of striving means there must be a little effort put into it, uh, must be a little work uh, to do uh, and some things to accomplish. So uh, all of us striving together, though, working together, we can get the job done. So be in prayer about that. Uh, tonight we have uh, with us uh, the Reese's, uh, missionaries uh, to Thailand, and they're new. Uh, by that I mean they're just starting out on deputation, I think January, is that correct? And so uh, uh, we're thankful for them. They're local also out of uh, uh, Alan Pierce's church on the uh, south side of town. And so uh, uh, actually uh, Pierce's have a little connection with Brother Turner, don't they? Uh, his sister is Mrs. Pierce. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I hadn't thought about that till just now, but uh, uh, that's a reality. But we're thankful to have uh, the Reese's with us tonight. We're going to let you come and uh, present your field to us, and your burden, and uh, hopefully we can catch that. And in our missions brochure, if we make the budget that we want to make, then we can add at least two missionaries. And so that would be something to be in prayer about. Well, good evening. No foreign language for me tonight, just good evening. <laughs> but it's good to be here at Cornerstone Baptist Church, and I just want to thank you for the role that this church has played in my life. Um, thinking back, I remember as a teenager attending youth rallies in this building, and uh, I remember as a, just going through those times and camp, camp uh, experiences with, with your church and Brother Rick leading a lot of that and uh, all of our background there, and I remember even as a 19-year-old young man uh, when my pastor Alan Pearson trusted me with an internship working with youth and showing up my first year at camp as a 19-year-old uh, youth leader. Uh, I'm thankful for the patience. I, 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 you, uh, Brother Rick may remember <laughs> that in that group of boys that we, we would bring, and I needed a lot of help at those times. I didn't know what I was doing, but I'm thankful for the role uh, of Brother Rick and, and his uh, influence uh, in all those years of, of leading youth in my life. Uh, and serving alongside him when I would, I would lead singing for the youth rallies once I was a youth pastor and just all the times of memories in this building uh, it's it's been great and I came in here I was saying it just it it, it feels so bright the sound sounds so great it was a, a, just a nice coming in here uh, and just all the memories and even with Pastor Turner uh, we go a, a long ways back too uh, just to spend some time with him uh, known him since I was a teenager too and so we're grateful for the privilege to be in this conference this week um, we're going to show our video here, and then I'm going to come back and just talk a little bit more about what the Lord's doing in our life right now. So let's go ahead and show that video if we can. How much do you know about Thailand? How much do you Admittedly, know about Thailand? I didn't know very much you know until God I called us to go. Until God called us to go. Hi, my name is Brian, and this is Hi, my name is Brian, and this is Hi, my name is Brian, and this is Alex, and we're the Reese family missionaries to Thailand. We're the Reese family. It really is amazing to see how God writes your story. My wife Angel and I were both saved as teenagers in the youth ministry at Northern Park Baptist Church in Greenwood, Indiana. We fell in love and we got married at the age of 20. And then God allowed us to serve in various ways. We served in the youth and music ministry at Northern Park Baptist Church in Greenwood. We served as house parents at Hope Children's Home in Tampa, Florida. Uh, we served a church planting. We planted Blue River Baptist Church in Edinburgh, Indiana. 
And now God's writing a new part of our story. He's calling our family to go to the mission field of Thailand. Did you know that Thailand means land of the free? Thailand is about the size of Michigan, Indiana, and Illinois combined and has a population of 68 million people. The capital city of Thailand is Bangkok. You've probably heard of that before, but did you know that the real full name for Bangkok is this? I am not even gonna try to pronounce that. Thailand used to be known as Siam. When you think about Siam, maybe you think about Siamese cats or Siamese twins, both of which originated in Thailand. The hit musical The King and I is banned in Thailand because they thought it portrayed the King of Siam in a bad light. One of the biggest holidays of the year is the King's birthday. And subsequently, it's also Father's Day. Thailand has the world's tallest hotel. And it also has the world's largest golden Buddha. But it's also home to the world's smallest mammal, the bumblebee bat. There are so many interesting and amazing things about Thailand. But undoubtedly, the most amazing and interesting thing about Thailand is its people. And they are truly the real reason why we are going to Thailand. Our goals are simple. It's the Great Commission. We're going to take the good news of Jesus Christ and share it with these precious people. As they become believers, we're going to disciple them in the truth of the Word of God. We're going to plant churches, and we're going to train up God-called leaders to become pastors and evangelists in this country. When a country like Thailand has a population of 68 million souls, 94.5% of them Buddhist, four and a half percent of them Muslim, only one half of one percent claim to be Christian, more missionaries are needed. Okay, so maybe you're saying to yourself right now, Brian, we've heard about Thailand, we've been introduced to your family, so how can we help? And I'm really glad you asked. We're really looking for this. We're looking for individuals and churches who would be willing to be sensitive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit as to whether they should partner with us. We're looking for partners in one of two ways. We're looking for prayer partners primarily. Folks who will begin to take our name, add it to their prayer list, and lift our family and our ministry in Thailand up to the Lord. And we're looking for financial partners. Churches who will take us on for a monthly commitment of financial support to help us get to Thailand and do the work that God has called us to do. So would you be willing to consider one or both of those ways to partner with us? We would really be grateful and we're so thankful for the opportunity that we have to serve the Lord in Thailand. Thank you for considering partnering with us. There was a young uh, Thai Buddhist teenage girl uh, named Pla, and like many uh, churches in Thailand, uh, one of the main ways they get started is by starting English classes, and so a church had an English class going, and Pla went. She wanted to learn English and practice English, uh, but as most churches do with their English classes, through the process of time, they use a lot of scripture, they use a lot of gospel to help teach English. And Pla received Jesus Christ as her Savior. And uh, Pla was able to continue attending church, which isn't always the case. Her parents continued to allow her to go. And she even eventually became a nanny uh, for one of the missionary families that they just, they actually just got back in the States this week for a furlough. Uh, but she was their nanny for their first year uh, uh, of, of ministry. And uh, there came a time in Pla's life where she became very ill, and uh, she was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And she continued coming to church and worshiping the Lord, uh, and eventually when she wasn't strong enough to get there herself, uh, her father and her mother 
whoever it was at the time, would bring her so that she could be in church, and they would sit there with her. And uh, when it got to the point in time in Pla's cancer journey that she could no longer go to church and she was in the hospital full time on hospice care, uh, the church members, uh, they just loved on her and they were faithful to be there and visiting her in the hospital. And on one of those hospital visits, uh, Pla's mother received Christ as her savior. And uh, eventually, as cancer tends to do, it took Pla's life. And at the funeral on the final day, her father stood up, an unbeliever, and talked about how much Pla loved her God. And to this point, as far as I know, Pla's father still hasn't placed his, his, his faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. But you can see the impact of missions in a place like Thailand. You can see that a young lady like Pla could get saved and her mother can get saved uh, through the ministry of missionaries. And that's what it's all about. It really is what it's all about. And my phone's going off up here. <laughs> it's my father-in-law, so you need to talk to your dad. No, but, but I've got, the reason I've got it up here is because this week in Thailand was their new year. And it's almost like a big water party. They got super soakers and buckets of water, and they just splash it on everybody and put baby powder on their face. It's Interesting, but they have a blast uh, with their New Year's. But it's one of the most, it is the most deadly time of year in Thailand. It just, and I just want to share it with you, just this week of their New Year celebration, uh, there were 2,216 accidents, uh, 259 deaths uh, just from, from automobile accidents. And I just want us to think for a moment uh, that if the statistics are true, like we saw in that video, 99.5% of them went out into eternity uh, to a place called hell. If we believe what Jesus said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We've got to realize that out of every thousand Thai people, 995, 99.5%, 995 of them enter into an eternity and they end up in hell. And only five know Jesus Christ as their Savior and go to heaven. And that's really, that's what it's all about. They need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we see that the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest they see the glorious light of the gospel. And the Bible, that passage goes on to say that that glorious light of the gospel hath shined in our hearts. And where is the gospel? We have it. And it's our responsibility. And it goes on in that passage and it talks about that we have that treasure in earthen vessels. That's all we are. And the illustration given in that passage, 2 Corinthians 4, that earthen vessel, it's like this little clay lamp. That inside that clay lamp, back in the times of the Bible, they'd put a precious treasure, that olive oil. And they'd have a wick that would hang out the end that they'd light, and that would light their way at night. Uh, this, just this little clay handheld pot. And the Bible says that's all we are. We're just this little clay handheld lamp that inside is a precious treasure. We've been indwelt with the Holy Spirit of God and we've been lit with the glorious light of the gospel. And we've got to take it to the place where it's dark, where the God of this world's blinded the minds of them which believe not, and we've got to share the glorious light of the gospel. And that's what God's calling us to do in Thailand. Uh, and that's what we're surrendering ourselves to go and do. Uh, so we, we would appreciate your prayers as we uh, continue on deputation just three and a half months in, and as many of you know, that's just, just a drop in the bucket, the beginning of a long journey, so pray for us. We've had some interesting experiences already uh, on the journey, and, uh, and one thing, I don't know if, if you've experienced this, Brother Stamper, but, uh, and Brother Turner probably has experienced this too, I really believe there's spiritual warfare that goes on on the highways. Uh, when missionaries and evangelists and, and the servants of God are traveling, I think there, are, there, is, there is warfare going on uh, above us uh, because I, wouldn't tell, I can't think back to how many times in my whole life there have been these close calls of semis veering over, uh, but just in three and a half months, it seems like it's all the time <laughs> uh, because uh, you know, we, need, we need your prayers <laughs> for safety and, uh, and we need your prayers for God to just bless and provide so we can get over there 
because these precious people, they need the gospel. We need to get there. We need to learn the language. We need to begin to preach the gospel and establish churches uh, all over this country. In a country like Thailand, we said 99.5% non-Christian. Uh, but in addition to that, 75% of the provinces, like our counties, uh, the provinces, 75% have zero Christian presence. No, no Bible, no preacher, no church. Uh, and that's what uh, we, we have the resources. We have the people. Uh, we just need to go. Amen. And so we appreciate your prayers in that. Thank you for having us uh, this week, Pastor. At this time, let's go ahead and stand and stretch just a little bit. We're going to look at another song. So take your hymnals. Let's look at 270. We'll sing the first and the last wonderful words of life. That's 270 tonight. And just lift it up with us tonight as we sing uh, wonderful words of life. 270 there. As I said earlier, bless both nights, I think, uh, with the messages God has spoken to our hearts, I believe, and moved in our lives, and we're thankful for the messages that Brother Turner has brought. Uh, before he comes and finishes the uh, text that he's been preaching on, I think we're same place, right? Same place. Same place. All right. Uh, Brother Reese is going to come and sing for us, and then Brother Turner, just come give us God's word.
Thank you. That's wonderful. Take your Bibles again tonight, if you would, and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. I sure have enjoyed the music, and I've enjoyed uh, the missionary presentations. I hope you have as well, and uh, certainly uh, ought to challenge us. I, I was sitting, listening to the song, and asking myself the question, would you rather have Jesus? And anything, I think the answer is yes. And I hope you can say yes to that tonight. Amen. I think that's what a mission conference is all about. Just getting us to come to the point that he is the preeminent one in every part of our lives. So thank you. That was just a wonderful song. Second Corinthians chapter number 8. <laughs> and for sake of time, I'm just going to ask you to stand. We'll read just a couple of verses. And then I'll try to finish these uh, thoughts about uh, missions and about how we can effectively uh, give by grace, principles of giving by grace. Now, let me just stop and say, I often meet people who do not believe in tithing. And so when, I, when they say they don't believe in tithing, they tell me, we believe in grace giving. And I always say to him, wow, that's interesting. How much more by grace did you give than when you tithed? Because grace is a better way. It is a better way. Did you get what I said? Tithe is a minimum. The tithe is a requirement. Uh, and I think, I think it comes down solidly in the New Testament. Read Matthew 23, 23. The Lord himself endorsed uh, tithing. But I, I do believe that we need to give beyond the tithe, and that is a matter of God's grace operating in our life. And that is, I believe, a great definition of grace giving, giving by grace beyond that requirement uh, that we had before the law and during the law and after the law uh, of tithing. Second Corinthians chapter 8, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the Grace of God. What a great phrase there. Bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy, <coughs> pardon me, and their deep poverty abounded unto the, rich, the, unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. And that's what I'm trying to challenge you about this week is giving uh, beyond your power. Giving beyond your power by letting God use His grace to bestow grace upon you and, and make it possible for you to do exceedingly and abundantly above that which you can ask or think. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. Thank you for the mission conference. Thank you for the missionaries. Thank you for the good singing, the special uh, music that has been played tonight. Thank you for the missionary presentation and how they've challenged our hearts. Thank you for uh, the Stampers and the Reeses who are willing to go. And we pray that we might be willing to pray and we might be willing to send and that we might be willing to grow in grace so that we can send more to the mission fields of the world. Have your way in the service tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We've been looking at the church at Corinth, and, and this letter invites them to uh, wit of or to take knowledge of uh, the grace of God that has been bestowed on the churches that Paul planted during his second missionary journey, the Macedonian uh, churches. And, and it talks about how that in their great trial of affliction and their deep, deep poverty, they had a phenomenal and abundant joy in serving the Lord. I want to say this one more time to you, and then I'll move on down the pike. God's people ought to be thankful for what we have, and we ought to rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice, amen? We ought to rejoice in what God has done for us. We need to take those old sad, depressed, discouraged, defeated looks off our face and let the world know that we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. And so tonight, I, I want to pick up where I left off last night as we uh, looked at the principles that are attempting to be taught 
uh, to this church at Corinth that they might experience the same kind of manifold, uh, abundant grace in their church that was experienced in the churches of Macedonia. And uh, so we talked about a couple of those principles last night, the principle of giving by equality and the principle of uh, giving out of that which you have gathered. And we learned uh, last night, <coughs> pardon me, the principle that uh, if you gain much in this life, uh, it, it still doesn't ever provide what you need. Haggai talked about it. The little prophet did, and he said uh, they went around with bags and they had money in their bags, but there were holes in the bag. And, and I'll tell you this, I, I've learned this by watching people over the years that the more you seem to have, the faster it seems to go, amen? And, and the more it slips away out of the bottom of that bag, and yet God can take that little bit that we have and stretch it and stretch it and stretch it and stretch it. In fact, let me just say to you, God is far better at stretching the 90% of that dollar than you are at stretching the whole dollar, amen? And he's able to make it uh, 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 abundant in your life and make it possible for you to give uh, out of grace and in a, an abundant way. And so uh, Wednesday night, we talked about surrendering ourselves to that plan of God. Uh, we, we, we talked about committing ourselves to grow in grace that we might uh, next year when we come to this conference be able to look back and say, hey, we're farther down the line spiritually than we were last year at Mission Conference. And we talked about remembering the sacrifice of God. Uh, I want to just say this to you tonight. I kind of ran out of time last night. I want to just throw this, tack it on the message a little bit from last night. May, may I remind you of that what God did for us uh, he loved us, and he gave himself for us, amen? And may I say that if God uh, was willing to give his son to die for us, the least we can do is to give our lives to live for him, amen? To give him the very best uh, of our life. Now, I want to pick up where I left off last night and talk about uh, two more principles, uh, principles that might help us learn how to allow the grace of God to be abundant in our life. Again, we talked about the equality of giving. We talked about giving out of our provision and knowing that God can expand it and God can make it go farther than we can and God will bless when we simply give. And if we're stingy, uh, God can make uh, that not go where it needs to go and not be effective in our life. So tonight I want to pick up with number three, principle number three, and that is... Uh, the law of sowing and reaping. Look with me uh, in your Bibles in chapter number nine, <coughs> pardon me, and verse six. But this I say, he uh, which soweth sparingly shall also reap sparingly, or shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also uh, bountifully. The law of sowing and reaping. Let me give you a few principles about sowing uh, and reaping. Now, I, I, I would assume in this crowd, uh, we'd know a little bit about sowing and reaping, about planting and harvest, because I assume that some of you have either been farmers or you've lived around farmers, and so uh, you ought to know something about uh, this matter of the law of sowing and reaping. But let me give you some principles about that tonight that I think uh, might help us. Number one, before there can be proper sowing and obviously any kind of reaping, there has to be preparation of the soil. There has to be preparation of the soil. Now, I'm not going to take a lot of time tonight on this, but if you join me for just a moment in Matthew chapter 13, <laughs> Matthew chapter 13, the Bible talks to us about uh, the sowing of the seed in the heart of man and explains to us a little bit about this principle of sowing and reaping. Verse number 3, And he spake many things, chapter 13 of Matthew, verse 3, unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and, de and uh, devoured them up. Some fell upon uh, stony places uh, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth, and then he says in verse 7, And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. 
but other fell into, notice this, good ground and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirtyfold. And then he says, if you got ears to hear, listen, get this message. Now, let me just talk to you about this uh, for just a moment. I, I live over in Hagerstown, uh, Indiana, and uh, I happen to live uh, in, pretty much in an Amish neighborhood. And on any given day, instead of seeing a big John Deere tractor, I see about six big old mules and uh, an Amish guy with his hat on behind them and tearing up the ground. And, uh, and when I see that, I always think back in my mind, are you all awake tonight? Uh, we should never feed people before church. I'm convinced of that. Amen. Uh, uh, just joking. Wonderful meal. Thank you very much. Uh, but but we, we have to prepare the ground. And Jeremiah talked about that. And he said, before you can uh, plant the seed and before it can be planted in the heart of men, uh, the very principle of sowing and reaping requires the preparation of the ground. And Jeremiah said, in order to plant the seed, you have to break up the fallow ground. Now, uh, when I got back from, I'd been in New Mexico and and Colorado and Texas and then back to Indiana, back to Colorado, back to Indiana and then I'm going to Boston next week and up into Maine and everywhere I travel, spring is sprung and, uh, and as I'm traveling around, uh, you, you see the flowers popping up out of the ground and, and it's the time of year, I, I don't, for me, it's just the best time of the year. I love the springtime. Do you love the springtime? Do you love anything? Some of you now wake up, come on, all right. Uh, I love the springtime. I, I love to see everything blossoming out. It's a beautiful time of the year. But one of the other things we see in my neighborhood, anyhow, are those mules out uh, with that Amish guy in his Amish hat, and he's on the back, and he is tearing up the ground. You know what he's doing? He's taking that old fallow, hard, stony, uh, uh, caked-up ground off of the top uh, so that uh, they can plant. Now, uh, some of you are going to say, well, you know, we don't do it that way anymore, Pastor. Okay, for those of you that think I don't know, I understand that some of the farmers plant right over the top of all that garbage, and what they do is they use what they call a drill, and they drill, but they drill through that and into the good soil uh, beneath that. But the bottom line is, if you're going to plant, you've got to have the preparation of the ground. Amen? And so I want to say to you tonight that uh, in, in our giving, we have to have the preparation of our hearts before uh, Almighty God. You can't plant in stony ground. You can't plant in thorny ground. You can't plant in hard ground. It requires the good ground. Amen? And, and so uh, Jeremiah says, break up that fallow ground. In other words, get the heart right with God. Can I just say to you, you'll never be a right giver. You listen to what I'm saying. You'll never be a good giver until your heart becomes tender before Almighty God. Until you submit yourself to the authority uh, of Almighty God in your life. And so uh, the preparation of the ground. And then number two, a principle of sowing and reaping is that you cannot ever reap a crop until you plant something. Now, duh, wasn't that brilliant? <laughs> are you all with me tonight? Say amen if you are. Wake up. I'm saying you won't get a harvest if you don't plant something. Amen? So I go out into, I've got um, our little hobby farm there, and we have uh, 18 acres of ground that I rent out for crops, and then we've got about 10 acres of pasture, and our pasture, I, I'm, I'm learning, we, we raised about five cows just for our own beef. And, and so, uh, I, you know, I was dumb. I wasn't a farmer. I didn't know much about it. I left the, the cows on a long time last year before I supplemented with hay. And, boy, I'm telling you, they nibbled it right down to the dirt. And Anybody ever raise cows here? Uh, it, you know what I'm talking about. They'll take her down if you leave them there. And we left them there, and they took her down. So... So I called the guy the other day, and I said, man, those cows have eaten that thing all the way down. I need to do something. He said, well, we need to reseed. We need to put on uh, some nitrogen, and we need to put on some potash, and we need to prepare the ground. And he said, then when you prepare the ground, I'll come out and I'll plant a really good seed, and that seed will have not only grass, but it will have legumes, and it will have clover, 
And he said, if you'll keep the cows off of it, in a few good weeks, you'll have some really good hay out there. And you can take that up and put it in the barn. And hopefully you can get another cutting or two out of it. Uh, but you've got to plant something or you're never going to get anything to come up. Amen. Now, I, we used to have grass there. I just was a dumb farmer. Well, let me rephrase that. Not that farmers are dumb, but I was a dumb one. Amen. <laughs> and I didn't know what to do with the cows, but now I know they've eaten all my grass. I'm not going to have grass until I do something about it. Somebody ought to wake up and say amen right here. We've got to plant some seed. We've got to plant some seed. And the principle is you're not going to get a return if you don't plant some seed. Now, let me help you with something. I am not talking tonight about this. Bless God. Hallelujah. I want you tonight to give to the Bruce Turner Ministries. And if you'll plant a $1,000 seed, I promise you that God will give you $10,000 by the end of this meeting. Now, if everybody gives me a thousand, boy, that'd be a lot of thousands. <clears throat> I'm not talking about that kind of seed planting. Let me just tell you, in case you don't know this right now, that crowd's a bunch of lying hypocrites. Stay away from them, amen? Stay away from them. But Matthew 25 does tell us that those who got the talents from God, if they planted them, God, uh, in a manifold way, blessed them and increased what they planted. Are you listening to me? But when they didn't plant it, when they, when they hid that treasure that God gave them, God took away even that which they had. Can somebody help me right here? I'm saying we got to prepare the ground. I'm saying if you're going to have a harvest, you have to plant uh, the seed. So Monday, I'll go to the co-op and, and they're going to mix up a brew of, uh, of uh, the different kinds of uh, uh, chemicals to help that grass come back. And then they'll put that grass seed in there and they'll plant that. And I expect to see something come up from it. Amen. Uh, when I moved out to the property <laughs> that we're on, uh, my wife wanted to have some fruit trees. So I planted some pear trees and some apple trees and things like that, and I'm watching them now, and they're leaving out, you know, and starting, uh, the cherry trees are blossoming, and the pear tree is blossomed out, and, uh, and uh, in just a little while, uh, I'll be traveling, but I'll come home one day, and I'll look out there, and that cherry tree in the back will be bright red with little sour cherries, and next to it will be a little cherry tree, and it'll be bright red with some sweet cherries, and over here, uh, there'll be uh, a pear tree that's going. And, and uh, all of that is by design. You know why we're going to have cherries? Because somebody planted a cherry tree. You know why we're going to have pears? Because somebody planted a pear tree. You know why you're going to have a harvest in your spiritual life when you learn to give? Because you learn somewhere to plant financially, to trust God, to give to missions. And I'm going to tell you, as I said on Wednesday night, God will not be outgiven. And as I said last night, you may shovel it into God and shovel it into the missions of this church and just keep shoveling and shoveling, but God's going to be over here shoveling it back and shoveling it back. And as I said last night, his shovel's bigger than your shovel. Amen? <coughs> and God is going to bless you when you are planting uh, seeds for him. Nothing ever grows that is not planted. I just challenge you, go home tonight and stand out in your yard and just look down at the ground and say, mm, next year I'm going to come out here and pick some apples. Well, duh. You're going to be disappointed when you come out there next year, amen? The only apple you're going to pick is maybe one someone threw at you on the yard and it's on the ground because there is no harvest if there is no planting. Would somebody help me to know you're getting this? Just say amen, all right? Never get anything but what you plant. <clears throat> I went down on the property that we own. I said to the farmer, Jeff, I said, Jeff, what are you planting this year? He said, beans. You know what the funniest thing is? I came back after he had planted in the spring. I came back around fall time for my meetings. And guess what? that whole 18 acres was covered with beans. 
That's the third principle about planting. You're going to get exactly what you plant. Amen. You know, as I said last night about that church, that about 50% of them had all totally given less than one penny. That's what they're going to get back from God. Because God says, give and it shall be what? Given unto you. So we must learn that we have to plant if we're going to get anything back. Our harvest is going to be based on exactly what we sow. If you plant little, you're going to get a little. If you plant a lot, you're going to get a lot. Now, I don't know about you tonight. I'm not trying to be theatrical here. <clears throat> but I want to tell you this tonight. I want to stand before God and I want to hear him say, Bruce Turner, well done, good and faithful servant. Come on, somebody talk to me tonight. Do you want to stand before God in the judgment and have him look at you and say, time and time and time and time again, I came to you in your heart during the mission conference or during a church service or during a Sunday school lesson while pastor was preaching and I laid it on your heart to do the right thing and to help send missionaries around the world and to do what, what the Bible says here in 2 Corinthians 8 and that is to take knowledge of the fact that God's grace will enable you to give more than you've ever given before. Do you want to stand before God and have him say, many times I spoke to your heart about that. And you said no to me. I, I, I know when I was a little boy, uh, by the way, some of you are going to doubt this, and don't you laugh because I'm, I'm a very sensitive person. <coughs> My mom died, it'll be uh, two years, and uh, uh, well, what is today? What's the date? Two years today. I said she died on tax day. It's just like my mom not to pay taxes. My, 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 my mom was a faithful Christian. She, she, she loved the Lord. And the last time I was with her, I said, Mom, I, I, just, I just want to hear it from you. Reva doesn't believe I was such a good kid. And she was pretty sick, but she said, Oh, he, Bruce, was just a wonderful kid. I want you to know I, I, I was a wonderful kid. Amen. I didn't get a lot of whoopings. You know why I didn't get a lot of whoopings? Because if my dad looked at me, I just melted. My son that, was that, he, that way when he was a little kid. I just, I'd say, Justin, you've broken my heart. And he'd start crying. He'd just start crying. He's sensitive. You know, I, I don't know if it's the way mom and dad raised me. I don't want to disappoint, disappoint the police officer on the on the road I've never wanted to disappoint church members in my church amen I, I've I've always wanted when somebody was sick preacher I know I know you how you've been I wanted to be there for them I've always wanted to please them but I'm going to say to you tonight if we're if we want to please men and have the accolades of men how much more we ought to want to please God and stand before him someday <coughs> and have him look at us and say, hey, hey, well done. You planted and planted and planted and planted and, and you've been faithful over a few things and I'm going to make you ruler over many things, amen. You're going to be the president of Kenya probably, brother, as faithful as you've been, amen. Wouldn't that be something else? We'd have to go over there and, and say, what is it, Jumbo? Jumbo, Mr. President. Amen. Wouldn't that be the coolest thing during the millennium? Amen. That'd be cool. Some of you, nothing's cool too. But anyhow, <laughs> I want to show you a second principle tonight. Are you still with me? The law of God's sufficiency. The law of God's sufficiency. Would you look with me in chapter 9? And verse number eight, <coughs> and I want you to read this out loud with me. Everybody, would you? And God is able, let's start over. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Here's what I want you to know tonight. I want to give you couple of proofs of this if you try to live in your flesh you're always going to come up short 
Have you ever said this? Well, I'll tell you, I'm trying to live the Christian life, but I just have to be honest with you. I have just found it hard to live the Christian life. Anybody ever said that to yourself? You ever had anybody say that to you? I just can't live the Christian life. And someone said that to me just a month or so ago, and I said, well, good, good, good. You're at the right place in your life right now. <clears throat> because when you come to a place in your life, when you understand that you cannot live the Christian life, that is when you submit to the authority of God in your life and you understand that and that alone is when God can begin to be efficient and effective and give grace in your life. Now let me prove that to you. James chapter 4 verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. But you go back up into verse 6. And he said, listen, God, if you humble yourself, God gives more grace to those that are humble. You know what that means to be humble? It means that you bow in the presence and under the authority of Almighty God. And you know, I can't do it myself, and there, but I'm going to do this because God said it. I'm going to do it because it's right, and I'm going to trust God to work in my life. Now, God says, I want you to know when you come to that point in your life, look back, back here at chapter 9 one more time. <coughs> Verse 8, he's made, able to make all grace abound. Can I ask you a question tonight? Who does grace belong to? Grace, grace, God's grace, right? It belongs to him. And God says, I want you to know when you come to me and submit yourself to me and you humble yourself before me. Some of you may be saying, I don't know how I could give anything to missions. I can't even hardly pay my bills now. I can't do this. I can't do that. Well, listen, let me ask you a question tonight. I want a hand, hand lifted up. How many of you say tonight, preacher, I believe what God says in the word of God. I believe what God says. I thought that would be the case. Do you believe then give and it shall be given unto you? So here's the reality. If you want the giving by God, if you want God to make grace abound in your life, you have to start by an act of faith in your life where you trust God, where you recognize you can't do it yourself, but God is able, amen? God is able. Now look at this. He's able to make all grace abound that ye always having all sufficiency in all things. You know what the number one <laughs> complaint was when I was a pastor? But I don't know if I give, I, I don't know if I have enough money when it comes time for rent. I don't know if I have enough money for gas. And I don't know if I have a, enough money for this. And I don't know whether this is going to work out. And we wring our hands and we take all kinds of pills to control our anxieties because we're living in such difficult time. And all along, God said, listen, listen, listen. If you're willing to trust me, I can make all of my grace abound toward you. And the more humble you are, the more grace I can give you. And I'll make everything to come out right I'll give you all sufficiency in other words everything you need he said in everything there'd be sufficiency amen I want to give you an illustration <coughs> pardon the cough when I retired I had uh, over the years uh, not taken most raises that were offered me and, and what I had done is plan for retirement and put some retirement away. The long and the short is that did not work out. Now, I want you to listen very carefully. I, I moved to Indiana, back to my home. I was born and raised, born in Richmond, raised in Liberty all my life. So we moved back to our, our home in Richmond and we actually got, had one of my classmates found us an apartment. My daughter and her husband and their four kids were living upstairs. Miss Reva and I were living in a little fireplace room in the basement. And uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't yet old enough to get Social Security. I had retired. I'd had two heart attacks and two back surgeries and lost, just gone through, you'll remember this, Jay, two feet of colon uh, removed. And I, I, I was a sick puppy. My son said to me the other day, Dad, if you'd have... <clears throat> stayed one more year, I believe we'd have buried you there. 
uh, I just, my health had just completely failed. So we're in this little apartment down there, and I'm telling you, I'm, I'm doing just what many of you have done and maybe some are doing right now. I, I, I'm thinking, how are we going to make it? And there's a part of me that feels this big. Now, you men will understand what I'm going to say. There's nothing that makes a man feel any smaller than not to know how to take care of the one he loves. Amen? And that's where I was. And I'm sitting down in that basement, and I'm telling you, I got so turned sideways with the Lord one day. I, I said to my wife, I just looked at her, and I said, Reva, what is God going to allow next? That's how frustrated I was. Now, I know that's horrible. And you're such a perfect Christian, you've never done anything like that. I know that, so, so just go ahead, boo, Brother Turner, it's okay, but I'm just trying to be transparent with you, and I'm trying to give you a lesson tonight that God takes care of his own, amen? I'm sitting down in that basement, and I'm telling you, I invited Elijah in, and we set up that juniper tree, and the two of us were sitting under that tree, and both of us had our thumbs in our mouth, and we were. I was just saying, I understand, Elijah, and he's saying, I understand, Bruce. We were just having a pitiful time down there together. My wife had a sister pass away, and she had, to, she had not yet passed, and she had to get down to Florida. And she, I said, honey, you go ahead. We, we'll raise up enough money for you to fly down, and, and I'll come by car when she passes. And, and my wife left, and that day I, I, that's the day I said to her, honey, what's God going to allow next? And she looked at me and said, why don't you get over yourself? women <laughs> why don't you just get over yourself how can you talk like that God's been good to us and he had she left on to Florida I'm sitting down there and Elijah and I are still having a little bit of a conversation we're still feeling pitiful together but I knew something because I'd preached it for many years I knew that when you get discouraged and defeated, you need to get into your Bible and read yourself out of it. Amen? So I got into the Word of God and began to read myself out of it. Stay with me now. Shortly through that morning, I was feeling pretty bad about the way I had treated God. I fell on my knees in the basement there in that little apartment, and I said, Dear God, would you forgive me? You've been so good to me. And his, these are the exact words I said to him, missionary. I had been in Kenya, in Eldoret, Kenya, and I'd walked through some of those little mud huts that those preachers lived in. And I, I'd even said to one of the men, look, when I get back to Tampa, we built them a church. I said, when, we, when I get back, I'm going to raise money and come build you a house. He said, oh, oh, no, preacher, no, 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 no. He said, that'd ruin me among my people. You can't do that. And God reminded me about that that morning, and I said, God, if I... So help me if I have to live in one of those little 12 by 12 mud huts. You've been a good redeemer and savior. I'm willing to do that. I said, I said this is what I said. I have a sense of humor and I think God does too. I said, Lord, <laughs> I said, I'll even, I'll even sleep in the back of a pickup truck as long as it's not pink. That's what I told the Lord. And I know this is the truth. I got up from that prayer. And my cell phone rang. And I answered the call. And the man on the other end said, this is John. I said, well, John, how are you? John is a man I led to Christ when he was 19 years old in, in Boston, Massachusetts. John came to me a couple of years later and said, uh, Pastor, I'm moving. I said, you're moving? Where are you moving? He said, I've invented something, and I know it's going to catch on. And I know I'm going to be a millionaire. And he said, I'm moving to some warm weather where I can manufacture what I'm doing. And John moved there. And little by little, he started getting his product, which was which is a computerized brain that would run lights and air conditioning and things. And pretty soon, one company picked it up and another company picked it up. And the next thing I heard, American Express had it, Visa had it. And pretty soon, he's traveling around the world installing these things, some of them as big as that choir loft to run huge, huge, huge buildings and facilities. And he said, I heard that you're living in a basement apartment. And he said, it's not acceptable, not for my pastor. And I said, brother, it is acceptable. I just told God it was acceptable. 
and I'm not going to go back on what I just told God. I said, everything's all right, everything's fine. He said, it might be all right with you, but it's not all right with me. He said, have you looked at any property? I said, I have. He said, uh, are you able to get it? I said, I said, we don't have any income right now. I guess I'm going to have to determine whether I go on uh, uh, disability, but I know I can't live on that. And I'm not sure what we're going to do. And he said, well, how about this property you like? You like it? I said, I like it a lot, but I said, we can't do anything. He said, I want you to go tomorrow and I want you to sign the contract on that property and in 24 hours the money will be in the bank I'm going to buy your home now I want to stop right there and tell you that I prayed about that I called a preacher friend and told him and he said well you idiot take the money (laughs) but God told us to take it as a loan and we did and we're paying it back, hoping down the road someone else maybe will be, be able to use that extra money that they had. But I'm telling you, I walked up the stairs. My daughter was upstairs. I walked upstairs and told her, and I began to weep, and she began to weep. And then I began to laugh. I couldn't quit laughing. And she couldn't quit laughing. And I said, you know what? God immediately brought the story I'm almost done here. The story of the disciples after they had fed the 5,000. You remember that? And he sent them out in the ship right smack dab into a storm. Whoa! And they were all Baptists, and here's what they were saying. Why did God have to send us out in this stinky old rickety ship and right in the middle of a big old wind like this? Couldn't he have sent us out when the wind wasn't blowing? And the answer is yes, he could have. He could have directed them around it. Come on, help me here. He could have said, stop, as they passed through it. He could have sent them on the next day, and it wouldn't have even been an issue. God could have done all of that. But he wanted them to understand and know and realize that he was the God of their life, and they needed to learn to trust him. And listen to what happened. They're out there, and the Bible says they're toiling in rowing. They're struggling, just like the Christian life. Amen? I mean, they're having a hard time. And guess what the Bible says? The Bible says Jesus is standing on the shore, and he's watching them. Here's the deal. He had never taken his eyes off of them. They had taken their eyes off of him. In fact, when he came out on the water to save them, they said, it's a ghost. You know they're Baptists. They're all freaked out all the time, amen? (laughs) It's a ghost, it's a ghost. Get down on the bottom of the ship. All the time it was Jesus coming to help them. Anybody getting this tonight? It was Jesus coming to help them. The Bible says after he delivered them, The disciples said this. I want you to get this. I'm I'm about to wrap. The disciples said they were sore amazed and they wondered because they had failed to consider the feeding of the 5,000. Has God ever done something big in your life? Say amen if he has. How is it that we forget that? How is it that Bruce Turner forgot that and said, what's God going to do next to me? I've been serving the Lord over 40 years. I've forgotten everything God had already done for me, even if, it's, even if the period came right after he saved me. Amen? Someone might say tonight, well, you know that, feeding of the 5,000 was way before he sent them out into the sea. No, you go back and read the verse right before, and it says, and straightway. Straightway after feeding the 5,000, straightway immediately, he sent them into the ship to go to the other side. They had just watched an incredible miracle and already had forgotten what God could do in their life. Somebody ought to say amen right now. I have to give you this illustration and I'll be done. 
<clears throat> I went to Boston. I was 24 years old when I started our first work there. I'll be preaching there next Wednesday night. And boy, I'll tell you, we we rented a little uh, building, and we were in there until we outgrew that, and then we bought a little Baptist church building that people had gone down to like five, I think, in the congregation. One night they knocked on our door and said, we need help, can you come and bail us out? And we took that building at $23,000 debt and 3% interest and paid that off real quick and filled that building up, and we went to look for a piece of property. Some of you remember back in the day, Mac Evans, who used to travel and sing out of Fall Wells and he had just been in our church and he had sung that song, We've Come This Far by Faith, Trusting in the Lord. And so I'm, I'm cruising out outside of town. I'm looking for land and I'm feeling pretty cocky and I'm singing, We've Come This Far by Faith. And I find a big old piece of property and there's some men out there. <coughs> and I say to them, Hey, who owns that property? And they look at me and they say, that man over there in that big three-story home, it's about to fall down. He lives up on the top thing, and you better be careful. He's senile, and he might just blow your brains out. Oh, thank you very much. I pull up into the driveway, and I step out, and I hear from the third floor, I hear a voice, what do you want? And I look up, and I'm telling you, it was like God just took over because I was just a little 26-year-old coward kid and didn't know much about anything. And I said, sir, sir, sir I'm, I'm out looking for property today. I said, I'm from such and such church and, and, I, and I'm trying to win boys and girls and men and women to Jesus. And I'm, I'm trying to tell them that they don't have to trust in religion that Jesus, I mean, I just went on and on. And I said, sir, I'm just, I just asked, came to ask you if you would. And instead of saying, I came to ask if I could buy some land. I said, I came, I just came to ask if you'd give me some land. (coughs) That old man looked down at me and he said, I've had people try to steal me out. I've had people try to burn me out. I've had people try to buy me out. I've never had anybody stupid enough to ask me if I'd give them property. I thought this isn't going too well. When all of a sudden he said, just wait right down there, would you? I'm coming down. This man was sick. He had big old legs that were infected and <laughs> he worked his way down. I, I know that this, I'm a little bit long here, but I got it late tonight and this is an important lesson for you. It'll help you tonight. He came down and he opened a car door on his side and he said, get in. I didn't know if he was going to take me somewhere and kill me. I didn't know. I Honestly, I didn't. They, those guys had scared me. I didn't know. I opened the passenger side. It was stacked up with newspapers and tin cans where he'd drive out on the back of the property. He said, we're going out to the knoll out here in the back. It's where I sit and do my thinking. When we got out there, I was sitting on top of tin cans and newspapers. <coughs> and he said this to me. <coughs> he said, Tell me this again, would you? And I told him again. And this time I had him one-on-one in the car and the tears began to flow down my cheeks. I, I was more interested in his soul at that point than I was a piece of property. I wish I could say I led that old man to the Lord. I didn't. But I left there that day and just a day or so later his attorney called me and he said, uh, I don't get it, but Mr so-and-so wants to give you three and a half acres of property. But he said, I'm insisting that the church come up with $25,000 because he has a granddaughter that's had a pledge made to her and we want to buy her out so we don't end up with a lawsuit. Can you come up with $25,000? I said, let me think. Yes. We bought that property. Some of you will remember this name, Andrew H. Card. Andrew H. Card Jr. was George W. Bush's chief of staff. His daddy, Andrew H. Card Sr., was my attorney. We were very close to that whole family, still are, to Andy Jr. And Mr. Card called me and he said, well, you've got this property, but he said, you have a problem. He said, in, in New England, you have to have a variance to have a church. And he said, I'm telling you, I've already seen the other attorney and the whole town's coming out against you and he said I don't think you have a shot 
He said, so we're going to go to town and you're going to have to speak. And he said, if you've ever preached, you better preach it tonight. I got up and did my best. I talked about God and his sovereignty led me there that day. I said, I understand your objections. But I want you to know if you stand against us tonight, you'll not stand against us. You'll stand against Almighty God. And I just very quietly sat down. Mr. Card leaned over to me and he said, I don't think there's any way this is going to happen. When about that time, from the very back row came that old man. He could barely walk. And he's shifting down that thing, his clothes tattered and torn big old legs that were infected with disease, barely able to walk. And he came and turned around and faced that congregation and he said, I want to tell you tonight, good neighbors of mine, he paused a moment, if you do not give this to this young man, this variance that will allow him to have a church on that property, he said, I will remind you this property is agricultural and I'll put a thousand pigs on it, so help me God. (laughs) The audience left that night. I was the last one out the door. And the zoning board, president of the zoning board, who was also an insurance man in town, as I walked by him, I said, good night, sir. And as I walked by, he grabbed my suit jacket and pulled me over and he said, stay a moment. He said, I want to just tell you, I'm going to let the good citizens wait two weeks to hear this. But I want you to go home and sleep well tonight. You have your variance. We built that building. By the way, land was going at $150,000 an acre at that time. And just a few years later, the man that led the charge against us at the end of the lane, he and his wife both came down with cancer. Our church loved on them, and we prayed for them. and We never, ever were revengeful at all toward them. And just before he passed away, he called me down, and he said, our family wants you to have that 10 acres next door that you've been trying to buy from us. $150,000 an acre, 10 acres, you figure it out. He said, I have gotten my children to sign off I just want $10,000 for each of my six kids. Can you come up with $60,000? I went to the church on a Sunday night and we raised all that we could of that $60,000 and stopped at at $35,000. And I didn't beat my people up. I said, you've done your best. God bless you. We'll just see what happens. And a man sitting in the back of the auditorium stood up and said, sir, may I speak? His name is Joseph Keller. He's a real estate man still to this day in Cape Cod. And he said, I don't know why I'm here tonight. I was driving down the street. I'm a Methodist. And he said, I came to your sign and the Spirit of God just said, turn in. And I turned in and I've sat here and listened to you preach tonight. He said, the difference in this service service is a difference in fire and ice. And he got real excited. And he said, I just want you to know I'm going to help you with this project. I didn't know he was a real estate man, didn't know anything about it. I went to my office, shook hands with everybody, including him, went to my office. My secretary walked in, and she said, have you seen this check? And I said, what check? She said, this check for the rest of that $60,000. She said, what do you want me to do with it? I said, I want you to drive right by the bank and deposit it before he changes his mind. (laughs) Do you think Bruce Turner could have orchestrated that? either in the first case or the second case. I bet you this missionary could tell us stories just like this. This one will be able to someday. I'm just here to tell you tonight, God is able to make his grace abound to us and give us all sufficiency in everything we need. And I'm just going to tell you tonight, the reason I do these conferences at 66 with a broken down body is I want to see the Church of Christ rally together and let God give them grace that they've never experienced before and let us reach the world before it's everlastingly too late. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? (coughs) (coughs) Some of you may be saying in your heart tonight, well, preacher, 
that's something you experienced, but that could never happen for me. No, no, he who sows sparingly shall reap sparingly. He that sows bountifully shall reap also bountifully. God will make his grace to abound in you in a marvelous way. Musicians are going to begin to play the invitation hymn tonight. I'll be back to preach on Sunday morning. But I'm wondering how many of you'd come tonight and just say, you know, I want that kind of grace in my life. Not that I can have a hobby farm or not that I can have something that I've always wanted, but that I can have God's grace operate in my life. I don't want to be doubtful. I, I don't want to live always wondering. I don't, I don't want to... I don't want to just live out of abundance. I don't want to just give because I can give. I want to give because God enabled me. <coughs> I wonder how many would just come to this altar tonight and say, we're going to face the faith promise offering here in just a few days, and I want to be prepared to allow God to do something magnificent, marvelous, abounding in my life. Would you come tonight and just talk to God about that? Numbers of people have come. Folks are still praying at the altar tonight. Would you join them? Would you join them? You say, I, I've never really experienced God's grace like that. Well, I'd like to, preacher. Well, how about coming and just saying, Lord, I submit myself to you tonight, and by your help and by your grace, I want to let you operate in me in a magnificent way. That's what I want in my life. You know what? I'm 66, but I've been praying, God, make these years the best years of my life. Let me learn to trust you more than I've ever trusted you. Give me more fruit for ministry as I try to plant across this country. Folks are still coming. And as folks continue to come tonight, how about you? How about you? Well, I'm not given, and I think this whole thing of faith promise, oh, listen. Listen, faith promise just means, God, I have faith enough to believe your grace can work in my life, and I promise if you work in my life by grace, I will be faithful to give. That's all it is. That's all it is. God, if you're faithful to me, I'll keep shoveling. As long as you keep shoveling back, I'll keep shoveling knowing that you got a bigger shovel than I got. Amen. Amen. Pastor's going to come in just a moment. If anyone else needs to come, right now is the time to come. It's still an early night. We wouldn't even be at halftime of a ball game. And this is a whole lot more important than a ball game. Souls are at stake all around the world. Amen. Souls are at stake. How about it, Pastor? Would you come? If God's speaking to your heart, there's still time for you to come. Well, we're thankful for the results that we've had this week. But I don't think there's any limit to what God can do we've seen it in our past also brother I'll tell you about it sometime but you know God works miracles he just has to have some instruments that are willing are you Amen. please be seated for just a moment I'm going to ask our missionaries and their families to come up to the platform if they would please. I appreciate the messages, they've been a blessing and I appreciate the missionaries Likewise, they have been a blessing to us. And I have so enjoyed uh, hearing about the work going on in Kenya. I'm anxious in the coming years to hear about the work in Thailand. 
what God has done. So we're thankful to have missionaries with us. Tonight, we'd like to recognize you just a little bit. Uh, first of all, Where's Andrew? Andrew, this one's for you. <laughs> now, that's for anything you want that they allow you to have. <laughs> okay, that's yours. They may cash it for you, but that's your money. All right? Aaron, would you like one too? <laughs> Abigail, that's your check. Anna, hey, that's our first one. And Alexander, you get one too. And I ran out of checks before I got to mom and dad. <laughs> Angel, likewise, this one is for you, not for me. Whatever you want. I know you have some cards sent you. We've been praying about some of those that you have to fix. And you didn't hear the story. Some of you did. But uh, she's driving at night, right? Yes. And she hears a pop. And she says, I think the luggage rack on the top is open or something. And so they drive back to Dallas. What city is it? Montana. Montana, middle of the night, driving back down the interstate, picking up his suit. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you've got some buttons to sew on. <laughs> so there are going to be all kinds of expenses to come along on your dedication. So thank you, Pastor. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So you give them a hand for being with us. Why don't you all go back to your uh, displays, and if you want to uh, let them know you appreciate them being with us, uh, certainly you get to do that. Let's all stand. This has been a blessing to me. I hope that it has to you. Brother Gerber, would you dismiss us in prayer, please? <laughs>